Hey, welcome back after the break. Uh, there's a question here from Saubhagya. She says, how can we escape from situations which devil brings into our life uh, to hurt us? Um, like I said, we have the word of God. So we speak God's word. God's word has more than 3,000 promises. Uh, we speak God's word into those situations. God's word has power. God's word carries life. God's uh, word brings about things that are not as though they are. It fulfills his promises. So uh, know what promises, know what God's word to speak in those situations. Also, you know, you need to engage with the enemy. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the gospel, it says that um, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Okay. So the kingdom of God suffers violent and we need to be violent means not physically go around, you know, beating people up and or persecuting you or, you know, being rude to you or all of those things, but violent in the spirit man. That means we present to take what is us what we know is our birthright. So if uh, uh, Satan is bringing poverty or, um, you know, or uh, a sickness in your family, you know it's not from God, then you just press in and you engage in battle. God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. He's given us his tools, his weapons, worship, prayer, fasting, you know, his word. Um, uh, so we speak that over our lives and then uh, we engage with the enemy and we press in to take hold of what is our birthright, what belongs to us. Yeah. Yes. Simangala uh, So, did I pronounce your name right? Sorry. Yes, you had your hand up. Oh, I made a mistake there. I made a mistake. It, it is well. Okay, no worries. Well. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's good to see you, at least one student uh, with that video on. It's good. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, just before we went for our break, we were looking at... Um, we looked at two um, guideposts or signposts. Which is the first one we looked in the beginning? The fifth one, recognize the leading of God's spirit. And then which is the sixth one? Recognize the circumstances and the situations. Okay. Now, um, uh, the seventh one, okay, we'll move on, is to recognize godly counsel and wisdom. Now, what is counsel? Advice, yes, instruction, also sharing of knowledge that you have. Okay, counsel is not a command. Okay, so when somebody gives you counsel, they're not commanding you, they're not giving you the 11th commandment. Ten commandments God has given you, that's not the 11th commandment. Okay, so counsel is not command. Now, godly counsel is counsel given to you by any man or woman who has a deep, strong, rooted, tested relationship with God based on their knowledge and their knowledge of the word of God and their knowledge with, uh, you know, uh, uh, their life walking with God and also their experience. Okay. Now, a good example of godly counsel is what we can see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 to 14 and verses 25 to 28. So here in this um, passage, you look in your books, we're on page number 22. Paul is talking about, um, about marriage, about divorce, uh, you know, and about virgins. Okay. So we'll just look at three verses, okay, uh, which is, uh, we'll see go about godly counsel here. In verse 10, you know, Paul says, now to the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Okay. So he's talking to married people. He's giving them a command. And Paul is saying, saying this, that even though I am telling you, or even though I'm writing this to you, it is not actually I am who I who am giving you this counsel advice. Who is giving this counsel advice? It's the Lord. Now look to verse, go to verse 12. He says, but to the rest, I not the Lord says. So here, who is giving them the counsel or the advice? It's I not the Lord. So who is giving the counsel here? 
Paul. So Paul is giving the counsel here. Paul is giving the godly counsel here. So he's very clearly saying, hey, now this is not God giving the counsel, but it's I who am giving you the counsel. Then look at what he says in verse 24 concerning virgins. Who are virgins? People who are unmarried. Okay. So he's saying, I have no commandment from the Lord. I means I have no counsel. I've not heard anything from the Lord. God not the Lord has not told me anything. Yet I am giving you this advice. So now who's giving the advice? Paul or the Lord? Paul. Okay. Paul is saying, hey, I have not heard anything from the Lord. So it's me who is giving you the advice. And you can ask this question. What right do you have, Paul, to give this advice? So he says, you know, because God in his mercy has made me trustworthy. So he's saying what I'm about to tell you, okay, what I'm going to say to you, I'm confident in saying this to you because this is the kind of advice I'm giving you is because God has trusted me with this responsibility to give you this counsel, okay? So sometimes God can give us counsel and advice. Sometimes it can be us who can give us the counsel and advice. And how do we know it? How do can people give it to us through years of experience, to their own experience, or also they've been trained in God's word, and so they're able to give you the counsel and the advice. Okay. Now here on page number 25, there are a whole list of um, scripture passages that talks about the value of receiving counsel. So I'm not going to read all of that. I will just ask you to read it for yourselves. Uh, yes, you have a question? Please take the mic. It's important. If you want to ask any questions, just ensure you have the mic, please. It'd be helpful. Uh, God always console according to the, the plans he have for us in our life. God always? Console according to the plans he have for us in yes, our Yes, God gives us counsel according counsel. to the plans and the wills he has for our lives, yes. Always. He can even use other people to give us advice and plans um, uh, and counsel for our lives, but we'll see that we need to validate that and how we need to validate that. Only according to the plans or it may be for other things too? Like other things too like means? You said that God have plans. Yes. For our life. Yes. Okay. And it's like he counsels us according to those plans only. Yes. Or, or there might be some other circumstance, circumstances that he can counsel us to. Yes. Right. God does not just tell us about our plans in our life. We go through circumstances, circumstances and situations in our lives. And we need counsel and advice. And God gives us the counsel and advice. You can either receive it from God's word, inner witness of the Holy Spirit. You can hear the Holy Spirit, uh, dreams and visions, or also through people. Yes. Like we can also receive it to counsel. Yes, you are you are only receiving all these things through inner witness, through you know the word of God, the Holy Spirit speaking to you, through other people speaking to you. Yes. Okay. So here on page number twenty-three is a whole lot of um, scripture passages that talks about counsel. We are not going to read it. It's basically saying that as human beings, we all need. We all need counsel. So it's not wrong to go and take counsel from anyone. Okay. I mean, anyone in the sense, you know, who need, you need to take counsel uh, from. So it's important and we need to humble ourselves to take counsel and advice from others as well, whether it's your parents, your pastor, your boss, or, you know, somebody who's your mentor or somebody who's, you know, um, uh, a senior in their faith, you can receive counsel from them, but we need to humble our Selves. Just an example from Exodus chapter 18. Now Moses must be sitting for morning, maybe four o'clock when the sun rises till the sun sets. And what is he doing the whole day? Judging people. There'll be a big queue with people coming with all of their problems. One will be saying, hey, they robbed my mana. Other will say, I kept the quail. They took my quail. You know, they're fighting with each other and whole list of problems they had and they come to Moses and Moses was sitting there and listening. And when Jethro, the father in law, comes and he sees, hey, Moses is sitting from morning till evening. Just what is he doing? Giving counsel and advice is like the judge. And what is going to happen to him? He's going to drain out, wear out, and you know, not live too long. 
So Jethro tells him, hey, if you're going to do this, it's, you're not going to last too long. So why don't you choose some elders from each tribe, people you know who are knowledgeable, who have a good counsel, set them up, let people go to them. And if they are not able to deal with some hard cases, let them bring them to you. Now, what do you think uh, Moses did? What did Moses do? Did he tell his father-in-law, Jethro, hey, you've just come to visit us. You're my father-in-law. Don't you know, you can't you see the staff in my hand? I did great miracles. I am the leader. God has given me the counsel and the wisdom. So just come, enjoy your stay and leave. Does he say that to him? No, he does not say that. What does he do? He acts on what he tells, the advice he gives, Moses. Okay, He takes his father-in-law's advice okay so what does that teach us it teaches us that moses was humble enough even though he was a leader he was leading this great multitude of people he had great miracles humble enough to listen to his father-in-law jethro okay so there are three kinds of uh, counsels that we can uh, 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 three kinds of uh, counsels that we can receive from. Okay, the first one is counsel. We are on page number twenty-four, based on a person's own knowledge and experience. So when you ask counsel from people, they can give you counsel based on their own experience and knowledge. Okay, second one is counsel based on the written word of God. So some people can give you counsel based on the word of God, or you can also receive it by yourself. And the third one is counsel based on prophetic inspiration. Okay, So important to note here, the first and the third. If you're receiving counsel from people and they're sharing based on their own knowledge and experience, and if you're basing your counsel on prophetic inspiration, it always needs to be attested or validated by the word of God. OK? So you can go to people who are knowledgeable, who know, but validate it with the word of God. Go back to the word of God. Say, God, this is what this person said. What, what do you say? Show me from your word. If you receive a prophetic word, it's important to go back to God's word and validate it in the Bible. Okay. So you're saying, hey, why prophetic word? Prophetic word means a person has received from God. Why should we go and validate it in the word of God? Now, let me give you an example. Now, David had in his heart to do what for God? Build a temple for God. So Nathan comes, Nathan the prophet comes to meet him. And Nathan the prophet tells him, you know, um, hey, um, uh, David tells Nathan, I want to build a temple for God. Okay. What does Nathan tell him? Great plan. Go ahead. God is with you. Do what you have purposed in your heart. Then Nathan goes away. And what happens? He's not able to sleep that night. God is telling him, go back to David, tell him he is not going to build it. But who's going to build it? His son Solomon is going to build it. Okay. So maybe Nathan would have said it from his knowledge or his mind. So that is why it's important for us to validate what we receive from counts, uh, from prophetic inspiration. So Counsel based on prophetic inspiration. You know, there are times when uh, when God can give that prophetic counsel, but there are times when, you know, the prophet can speak on from his own mind. Now, some of us, you know, everything what the prophet says and does, we take it as prophetic. So even if the prophet sees sneezes, we say, hey, this is a prophetic sneeze. Okay. So that's not what we need to be doing. Okay. But we see in... Um, uh, first, Corinth, uh, first Chronicles chapter 17, we see how, you know, Nathan tells him, hey, go ahead, do a good plan. But then God says, this is not my plan. So we need to validate what a prophet says through the word of God. Okay. Um, and also the first one based on person's own knowledge and experience. But even as we go and ask people for counsel, we need to be careful who we ask counsel from. Now, suppose you're having a problem with a in your business, then who will you go to? You will not go to a marriage counselor to give you counsel. What will you having a say? Are you having a problem with your uh, your uh, business partner? Okay, you won't go to a marriage counselor to give you advice. What will a marriage counselor do? Give you the counsel from the word of God. Says what 
God has put together, no man can put asunder. Okay, so that is not the right counsel. Okay, that is not the right counsel you need for your business. So if you need to know anything about your business, who would you go to? A businessman who is well established in his business. But you're saying, hey, that businessman, he is not uh, prophetic. He is not, uh, you know, super spiritual. Uh, I don't think he has that much great faith. Or uh, you know, he's a he's not a uh, he's an unbeliever. It's okay. He's an unbeliever, but he still has experience, knowledge. You can receive from his experience and knowledge. But if the person tells you to do something wrong, engage in some wrong practice, hey, you give up your business partner, but before that, you do all of these things, take away this money, do this, change this thing and that thing, that is wrong. You know that is wrong. You don't obey that. So you use your own wisdom and your discernment. Okay. Now, suppose you have a, a problem with... Um, uh, you know, um, uh, finances, your finances, okay? You won't go to pastor, right? What will pastors tell you if you go? Did you pay your tithes? <laughs> then he'll tell you Malachi chapter 3, you know what it says in Malachi chapter 3 verse 9, you have to give your tithes. Did you pay your tithes? Then you say, yes, sometimes pastor, sometimes I've forgotten, sometimes I missed, and the pastor will say, that is why you're having problem in your finances. So he's looking at it from the word of God. Or he's saying, did, did you did you invest in ministry in some organization? Did you give for missionaries? He's saying, why did I come to us? <laughs> you know? So when you're having a problem with your finances, who do you go to? You go to some financial advisor, you go to your CA, yes, and he will tell you what you need to do and what not to do. So that is what we do as Christians. We go to the wrong people. Right, and then we mess up, we blame them, we blame God, and we are in a greater fix than what we were uh, before. Okay, so we need to go to the right people. Okay, and um, we even when you receive prophetic counsel, Second Thessalonians, I think Second Thessalonians chapter five verse twenty uh, says, "Test all prophecies." Okay, don't despise prophecies, but test all prophecies. And how do you test prophecies? Through the word of God. So when you've got counsel, how do you test counsel? You got counsel from somewhere, something, some place, some person. How do you test counsel? Look at what Paul writes in Romans chapter 14 verse 17. Romans chapter 14 verse 17. What does it say? What does it say? Romans 14, 17? For the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy. So you say, hey, how does this go with counsel? Okay, if a counsel is producing righteousness, if it is right, godly, you know, is, is in godly standards, it's right. Okay, it's leading you in the right way. It's right before God. It's bringing peace in your heart. Remember, I told you, peace is one way the Holy Spirit is confirming, saying, yes, this is right. This is what you need to do. Joy is another feeling that the Holy Spirit gives you. Yes, joy. Also saying, yes, this is right. This is what God wants you to do. Then you know that it is from, this counsel is from God. If it's not, then you know it's not from the king of the kingdom, and it's not going to enhance you or help you or uh, do anything for you. Okay? So we must learn to receive counsel. We must be humble enough to receive counsel. Go to somebody who's qualified to talk about your circumstance, your situation, through whom you will receive, who can speak into your life, and who will give you an unbiased view of your life. They will tell you things as it has to be said. They will not look at you and say, oh, you know, tell you, some things that will please you. They look at you in your face and tell you what is right, what is wrong. Okay. And you can have people who are godly to speak into your life. And so you can use godly counsel for people to guide you into God's plan and purpose for your life. Okay.
So Shubham says, uh, if someone gives a good counseling but does not live a good life, should we take his counseling? If someone gives you good counsel but does not live a good life, should we take his counseling? Yes, no? Yes? No? You can go back and validate it with God's word. Yes, you need to do that. But we need to know that none of us are perfect. Right? Maybe that person is counseling you because that person has messed up in that area or done something wrong or learned. That person is giving you the counsel. So you can receive it, but always validate it. Okay? Okay, we'll move on to the next um, uh, principle. Okay? Recognize the times and the seasons. Okay? So if you want to discover God's plan and purpose for your life, it's very important to understand this truth that we need to recognize the times and seasons. Now, God works according to a timetable. We said that in the beginning, right? In our first class, God does not do things randomly. He does not do things arbitrarily. He does everything with a plan and purpose. And everything that he has planned and purposed, when has he planned and purposed it? Even before the foundations of the world, even before he created the world. Now, he does everything with a specific time and season and plan in mind. For example, when God spoke in the, Adam, in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve after their sin, he said, the seed of the woman will destroy the head of the serpent. Okay? Now, when was that accomplished? When was that fulfilled? 4,000 years after God had spoken it. Who is the seed of the woman? Jesus Christ, yes, who destroyed the head of the serpent. When did he destroy the head of the serpent? On the cross, okay? So why did it take God 4,000 years to fulfill it? Look at what Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says. It says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, meaning... In the opportune, opportune time, in the Kairos moment. Now, God works in the Kronos time and the Kairos time. Kronos time is a chronological time, the time that he is building up to release and birth his plan and purpose, which is the Kairos time. So the Kronos time or the chronological time is at period in history when he's planning everything. So he planned everything and at the right moment, at the Kairos moment, he brings Jesus on the earth and Jesus is born and then he dies on the cross and he pays a punishment for our sins. That's the Kairos time, Kairos moment. So we see that, you know, in the fullness of time, so God was waiting for the fullness of time before he could send his son. So also God has appointed times and seasons for things that he does. For example, when um, God tells uh, Abraham that your descendants will be as slaves in an unknown country for how many years? 400 years. And we see that when Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, after that God raises up Moses. Of course, it took 440 years why 40 years? Because not God's delay, Moses delayed everything. So the extra 40 years. Okay. And we also see another example, uh, Babylonian captivity, Judah, you know, that King Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Judah and took all the people as uh, slaves to Babylon. And God said, how many years will they be in captivity? 70 years. And the end of 70 years, in the, Cairo, in the Kairos moment, God raises up King Cyrus and puts it in his heart to send back the people of Israel or the Jews back to, the, uh, to their Jerusalem and they start building up Jerusalem. Okay, So we see how God works in appointed set times and calendars which he has already determined. In the same way, God has a timetable for you. Now all of you are very um, uh, you know, well versed with timetable because all of you here in person students are following a set timetable, a set pattern. Look at what Psalms 31, verse 15 says. Can somebody read that, please? Who's reading it? My times are, who's reading? My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies. 
and from and from them that persecute me amen so your times are in whose hand god's time isn't that a wonderful assurance amen Amen. That our times are in God's hand and nothing can happen that can hinder God's plan and purpose for our lives. Uh, look at uh, your books on page number 25. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. Can somebody read only verse 1 please? To everything there is a season. A time for everything. Sorry. To a time for every purpose under heaven. For everything there is a time and a season so god works in times and season look at what verse 11 says can somebody read verse 11 he had made everything beautiful in his time also he has put etern uh, eternity in their hearts except that no one can find out the work that god does from beginning to end amen okay so what does this word says that there is set times and seasons and what does god do in the set times and season, he makes all things beautiful, all things perfect. He brings everything to perfection, beauty, and to fullness of maturity in his appointed time. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. So we need to learn to see life or view life through times and seasons. That is how God works. You know, and we need to understand that in every season, God has a purpose amen so if you understand the season of life that you are in now you will understand what you are supposed to do what is the season of life that you are in in person students what is the season of life you are in now huh student so you're preparing yourself for ministry right you're preparing yourself for Yes, you're preparing yourself to ministry, to build the kingdom of God. Thank you, Elkanah. You are learning. Yes, you're equipping yourself. You're strengthening yourself in your faith, in your walk, in the scriptures, in the revelation, so that you can be powerful uh, uh, kingdom builders. Sorry? Building your spiritual lives. Yes. Okay. So if you understand the season of life you are in right now, you will understand what you are supposed to do. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Look at what the first Chronicles chapter 12 verse 32 says. Of the sons of Iskar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command amen so here we see that the sons of issachar what did they have they have the understanding of the time so when you have an understanding of the time or the season of life that you are presently in you will be able to determine what course of action to take what are you supposed to do and you will pursue that and you will fulfill and carry out what god has called you to do so now you're in a season of life where you're training equipping learning preparing yourself so you spend all of your time doing what not just sitting around talking getting to know each other joking looking at youtube videos you know just learning some music instruments learning to sing i mean all that is part of it but you're learning the word of God. So please go back and read these lectures, listen to the lectures, because you are going to go back and preach the truth. You are going to go back and teach this truth to people who do not know this profound truths. So if you don't know this truth, and if you are not sure of these truths, you can't teach these truths, right? And also you need to live these truths before you teach them. So please take time to read, to prepare, to plan, you know, and to equip yourself in an efficient way. Look at what Ecclesiastes chapter um, 8, verse 5 and 6 says. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. He who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful, and a wise man's heart descends both time and judgment. Because for every matter there is a time and judgment though the misery of man increases greatly yes so here it's saying that there is a time and there is a right thing to do it and it's 
who will be able to understand what they need to do? A wise man. A wise man understands both the time and the action to take. How many of you are wise? <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Yes. If you're not wise, you can ask God. He gives you wisdom very, very freely. You can ask him even now. Okay. So, you know, it takes a wise man to understand both the time and the action. So our goal should be, God, what season of life I am in. Please give me some wisdom. Please give me some discernment to understand what season of life I am in and what kind of action I'm supposed to take, what I'm supposed to do. Okay. Now, there are several examples of seasons that we can talk about, but we'll just talk about a few. The first one is a foundation or the laying season. Now, you know, the foundation season uh, or the foundation is very important for a building. Yes or no? Why is the foundation important? Because it gives stability and strength to the building. If your foundation is weak, your building will be very, very weak, right? So it will just come down like a pack of cards. What's happening at the back? To come down as a pack of cards, OK? So your the foundation period is also a very, very difficult period, OK? And how, what is the difficulty in that period? It's a time when you'll have to really work hard. It's a digging period. You'll have to dig and dig and dig. You'll have to work hard. You will have to, um, you know, it will be very, very dirty, messy. It will not be clean. When people look at the foundation, they'll all see just one deep hole, right? But that is the foundation. And that is very, very important because that is going to build up the big gift the foundation or the strength to the building, OK? And that is something that is going to determine your future and how big your work is going to be, OK? So the foundation period is very hard. It's messy. It's not glamorous. Nobody stands around and claps for you and say, hey, you know, you did a hard job digging, digging this big hole, OK? But in the foundation period, there are certain objectives. If you want your building to be strong, you have to go deeper. And if you want to really your building to be high and you know um, tall, you need to go really deep, which requires more work. Okay. So take for example, you finished your studies in college, you get a job and you go for your job. Okay, you're new to the job, you're learning about um, the ethics there, you're learning about uh, what your job entails, the quality you need to give, and it's going to be very, very difficult the first three, four years of your life. You know, your boss can be very difficult, he can put, uh, you know, a lot of work on you, give you a lot of things to do, and uh, what do you see after three months? Hey, my boss is very, very... Straight, Kadus Manas hai, Kadus, I'm saying Gujarati, Kadus Admi hai, very, very rude man, not at all uh, helpful, not at all loving, you know, I'm going to quit my job, okay? And you quit your job and you think you'll go to a next job and you'll, things will be easy. But no, the same thing is going to follow there, why? It's a foundation period. It's going to be messy. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a lot of hard work. It's going to be very difficult. You need to give in a lot, press in, do everything. Even if your boss is difficult, your boss is nice. And then at the end of three or four years, people will look at you and say, hey, this guy or this girl, you know, this lady has, you know, followed, brought quality, done things very well, done things with excellence, and then they will give you the promotion. So foundation years is going to be very, very difficult. It's not going to be easy, and it is very, very important, OK? So the next stage is, um, OK, there are some objectives. They said the stronger the foundation, the deeper the foundation, the foundation will allow you to expand. Then there is tunnel seasons. What are tunnel seasons? All of you have gone in trains where you go through tunnels. You know, I've traveled from Pune to Mumbai, and there are so many tunnels. And when you go to those tunnels, there are, you know, it's dark, and you know, can hear people screaming, kids screaming. And, uh, but you eventually come out of the tunnel, and there is light. But in that tunnel we go through, there's pitch darkness. You can't see anything. So, also, we go through seasons in life where we 
you know, things are difficult, situations, circumstances pressing on you, crushing on you. You don't see light, but you just hold on to God. You say, God, I'm just trusting you. I'm walking by faith. I can't see anything. I'm just trusting and I'm depending on you in faith. Okay. And then eventually God brings you out and you see the light and you see the beauty. I remember, you know, traveling from Pune to Mumbai, it's all to the guards and you see beautiful landscapes when you come out in the uh, open. Uh, for those of you who are from not from India, Pune to Mumbai, Mumbai is one of the metropolitan cities in India and Pune is a town or a city very close by to Mumbai. Yes. Please take the mic and no. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, um, that is the tunnel season okay so it's going to go be dark there are mountains giants challenges that you uh, face but you are saying god i'm just sticking on to you i'm holding on to you i'm trusting in you in faith depending on you and you stay faithful okay now in this season uh, there are other seasons also uh, is just enough season versus abundance and harvest okay now when we are with our parents you know we just spend our parents money we buy what we want eat sometimes we throw tantrums if they don't give us what we want but when we get married we are earning we get married we you know move out to our own house hey we don't have money to pay the rent so we'll take one bedroom apartment no car, only gadi, one two-wheeler, or sometimes just walk, or we manage. And that time, no going and eating out because, you know, you have to manage the whole monthly bills. But when you're in a father's house, you were, you know, enjoying yourself, doing everything. So that is a season where it is, a, you know, just enough season versus abundance. Okay, But that time is not going to last too long, right? You're going to move up in your job you're going to get an increment your pay is going to increase so along comes johnny or esther or ruth or whatever and then you need two bedrooms you know and so you move into a, a new house or you move into two bedroom or you get a car because you're able to afford it so there are seasons where it is just enough where you're just managing scraping through the month and there are seasons where you just does not last the just enough season does not last but you move into a time where there is plenty and abundance and harvest. There are also seasons of griefs and sorrows, okay? Times when we go through loss, grief, when we lose our loved ones, broken relationships, uh, broken marriages, divorce, separations in the family, joint family, things uh, are separated. And you go through a lot of grief and sorrow and heartache and brokenness. Anything can be even business because of that. You're going through grief and sorrow, a heartache, whatever, loss of job, or you go through trials and challenges, another season in life, you know, um, where you go through difficulties and struggles, or you go through seasons of motherhood or parenting. Okay. All of these are seasons and times that we go through in life. Okay. But what do we do through all of these seasons? We The key is that we stay faithful, committed. We learn to manage with the little that we have because God says in Luke chapter 16, verses 10 and 11, if we are faithful with the little things, he will give us much. Okay? So go through these seasons, even as we go through these seasons of grief, sorrow, trials, challenges, you know, um, motherhood, there are different aspects of your character that God is shaping and training you, okay? Sometimes God is even using these things, these challenges, these difficulties to test you, to train you, to bring you out like gold. You know, you've gone through the fire, you come out as gold, pure, solid, valuable for his kingdom, okay? And, um, you know... Um, so just stick on and also just like to mention the seasons of motherhood some of them you know going through motherhood they're saying hey i did my i studied for so long i did such big degrees i you know i got such good grades but here look at me confined in this house with this baby always crying or changing the diapers or feeding the baby but you need to enjoy that season because that season is not going to last too long your children are going to grow they're going to school you can take up a job you can move on to the next season of life so you don't grumble and murmur and say hey 
what is this God? I've studied so much. I'm here sitting the four walls with this baby, always taking care, always feeding, always cooking, always washing and cleaning. No, what is this God? Hey, this is a season in life. Enjoy it. So enjoy your seasons of life. Because if you're not a mother, that can be another difficult season. Everybody's having babies. I'm not having a baby. Everybody's becoming parents. We are not becoming parents. But when God has blessed you, enjoy that season. Go to that season. It's not going to last. But learn things in the seasons of life that he is taking you through. So if you're going through troubles and difficulties, say, God, what is the... I'm going through a season of troubles and difficulties. What are you teaching me, God? Maybe God is training you, testing you, uh, you know, refining you, refining your character, saying, God, is anything in my life that is being a hindrance, is hurting you, is grieving you, any sin, show me, God, that is bringing all of these in my life. God can show you, correct it, and then you just move on, okay? So we'll move on to the next uh, and the last guidepost, okay? Recognizing God's pattern of working. Now, God works in, we saw in seasons, but he also works in patterns. We look at some uh, examples. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. So can somebody read that, please? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ Jesus come into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, of this season I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as the pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Amen. So Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, it's his last epistle in his Roman imprisonment, and he knows that this impending upon sorry, death is impending on him. He's going to die soon. So, what is he saying that he's saying here? Hey, ministry, Timothy, is, is suffering, is going through hardships and difficulties. So he's telling Timothy because he put Timothy in Ephesus, which is a difficult place, a difficult city. He's facing a lot of challenges. So he's encouraging Timothy and saying, hey, Timothy, endure. Okay, you have to suffer long in the ministry. Look at my life. Okay, I'm a pattern for those who believe in the Lord for everlasting life. So some of you are saying, hey, I'm in ministry. I've been suffering for so long. Hey, look at Paul's life. He was a great apostle, a great minister, a great missionary, but he too went through so many hardships and difficulties. So he's saying, I'm a pattern for that. So follow me. Okay, look at what uh, Paul writes to the church at Romans in Romans chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. He gives the example of Abraham. Can somebody read that, please? And, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe through they are uncircumcised, that that righteousness might be inputted to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had, had while still uncircumcised. Amen. Thank you. So Paul is writing to the church at Rome and he's writing to Jews and the Jews were saying that, hey, we have to, even if you're believers, you have to follow certain rituals the food, the Jewish practices, keeping of the law, the circumcision ritual, uh, which is a physical sign of the covenant. You have to follow all of that. So Paul is saying, hey, you don't have to follow all of this because this does not make us right before God. What makes us right before God? How do we receive our righteousness? Paul says righteousness is by grace through faith. And he starts writing that in chapter 3. In chapter 4, he's talking about righteousness through faith. In chapter 5, he's writing about righteousness through grace. And so he's saying we are made righteous not by our works, not by keeping our rituals of uh, circumcision of the covenant, not by following the law, but we are made righteous. How? By grace through faith. And he says, he gives an example. And whose example he's giving here? Abraham. And why is he giving the example of Abraham? Because Abraham was their forefather and everybody, the Jews would easily listen to what Abraham said. So he's saying, hey, how did, how was Abraham declared as righteous? I think Genesis chapter 15, you know, Genesis chapter 15, God says, your 
you know, uh, Abraham was made righteous because of his faith. Okay, by his faith. And then in verse, in chapter 17, God brings in the circumcision covenant. So he's saying, hey, Abraham did not have the law. He did not have the circumcision sign of the covenant. But before that, God declared him as righteous. And how was he declared as righteous? Through his faith. And so he's telling them, this is a pattern. Follow this pattern that Abraham, that God started from Abraham, that we are made righteous by faith. Okay. Another example we also see is um, Job. Okay. Uh, in James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, okay, talks about Job there. Okay. Job is also a pattern of how we can walk in faith. Okay. What is a pattern we follow of Job? How is Job an example? A pattern that we can follow? Patience, endurance, perseverance in the midst of trials, challenges, and difficulties. So Job went through various trials, difficulties, challenges, sicknesses, but yet he persevered and he endured. So James is telling us, hey, follow his pattern. Follow the pattern of Job. Okay. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses um, uh, 5 to 11 here, Paul is talking about the Old Testament of the Israelites. And he's saying that this is a pattern that you need to follow how you need to live on the earth. So can somebody read that, please? 1 Corinthians 10, 5 to 11. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. wilderness. Now all these things happen, can continue, now please. All these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So what is Paul saying here? He's saying here that, hey, look at the Israelites. Learn from the Israelites when you read the Old Testament. Okay. What happened to them? They constantly grumbled, murmured, complained, disobeyed, and went against God. And what was their punishment? They died in the wilderness. They did not enter the promised land. So don't follow their lifestyle. Don't follow their pattern. Learn from their way and how God dealt with them. So we see that, you know, there are patterns that God does in the Bible, which we can learn from and follow. So we also need to look carefully at our own lives. There are certain ways of doing things, okay? The certain way God is unfolding his plan, certain way God is leading you, certain way God is using you a pattern that God is following in your life, okay? And through this pattern, you know, God is showing you what is his plan and purpose. I'll just close by saying this, you know, um, uh, you know, when I was, I told you, right, I, I didn't want to be in children's ministry, I wanted to do counseling, but everywhere I went, God opened doors for children's ministry. Even before I went to Bible college, I was ministering in my church I was teaching Sunday school. When I went to Bible college in the campus, they put me in children's ministry. Weekend when we went to churches, they put me in children's ministry. During the week, they put me even in school ministry, right? And when I, came, when I went for my internship, seven months of internship during my Bible college, I went to counsel drug addicts and alcoholics, but I ended up staying with children they picked up from Howrah platform. Ended up ministering with rag picker children. Ended up ministering to children who were, you know, of commercial sex workers. Okay. So minister to whole of these areas of children. And I see God was orchestrating those circumstances. I see a set pattern that God was doing. Okay. So in the same way, how do you know God's plan and purpose for your life? Look at the pattern that he has been doing things in your life. Okay. Because... The pattern that God is working in, you know, he knows, he's revealing it to you, and you can just follow that. And when you do that, you will succeed. Okay? We'll stop here and we finish chapter 2. We have, we'll move on to chapter 3 um, next week. Any questions? We just have a minute. Any questions? Any questions anyone has? Online students, anyone?
Can you please sit there? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Is your mic on? Can you please repeat so it? You one? studied about like you wanted to work in between the drug addicts. Yes, with drug addicts and alcoholics. Yes. So you studied about that, right? More. Right? I did not study. We did not like, have a course, but, but I did a thesis on it. Yeah, yes, because I was interested. You yes. Was, like you did your own studies, yes. right? Yes. So like, but God used you in different way. Yes. So what do you think that? This children ministry is more effective in your life or that drug? I know children's ministry is more effective because I've not been trained in children's ministry, but I've seen the way God has given me creative ideas, helped me to write curriculums. I'm still writing curriculums to understand children's minds, to engage. You know, I just see uh, uh, God's move and, you know, his, um, his grace that is so evident to fulfill that function and like we're going to study you know um, and even pastor mentioned this morning you know uh, if you want to experience god's favor in your life you have to position yourself right when you position yourself right you receive the favor the grace the blessing uh, of god yes okay thank you everyone for um, class thank you have a blessed day god bless thank you